Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello and welcome to another Historic Brawl Games video. Today we're taking a look at a blue-green Taunos Toymaker deck as voted on by my supporters on Patreon. The 5-mana 3-5 Human Artificer says whenever we cast a beast or bird creature spell, we may copy it, except the copy is an artifact in addition to its other types. So Taunos rewards us for playing bird and beast tribal, essentially. And there's quite a few decent birds and beasts printed over the years, even though legendary beasts like Questing Beast don't have the best synergy if we try and copy them with Taunos, so I left those out. So I've split up the deck into a few different categories, but before we start I want to highlight Swiftfoot Boots, a new printing from the Brothers War Retro Artifact, which will give all these Brawl decks a way to protect their commander, as well as to give it haste. So I think this is going to be a staple in almost every Brawl deck that heavily relies on its commander surviving. So so just wanted to point that one out. So we're also playing it to protect Taunos. Then the main category here is going to be ramp cards, ways to generate mana. So we can hopefully play Taunos starting on turn 4 already. So we can copy our powerful beasts on the following turn. So at 1 mana we have Elvish Mystic and Lunar Elves. Gilded Goose, also a bird. So we can potentially copy it with Taunos later in the game to start gaining more life. We've got some cards like Explore and Grow Spiral to play an extra land early on. Karyotid can often make 2 mana if we get a larger creature in play. We've got Into the North to find a snow land, which is why we're playing 10 snow-covered islands and 20 snow-covered forests. Could potentially also play Faceless Haven if we want an extra land to search up with Into the North. That offers a bit of utility in the late game, but for the most part, I don't think our deck really has time to deploy too many creature lands, for instance, since we have so many expensive cards we need to cast. And then uh, Leafkin can also potentially make double green if we get four or more creatures in play. Paradise Druid has Hexproof as long as it's untapped, so making it a great target for our various Mutate creatures, which we'll get to in a second, which also have great synergy with Taunos. And then Haven, another enchantment that can potentially make an extra mana. And then we've got some two-mana ramp artifacts with Signet, Heart, Idol, and Mindstone. And then at three mana there's Kelpie Guide, which can technically help us accelerate our mana by untapping a land, for instance, with the tap ability. And then once we get to eight or more lands, it can also start tapping opposing permanents down. And as a beast, we can also copy it with Taunos. Then Cultivate at 3, another staple, and Celestus can give us some card selection. At 4 mana there's Migration Path and Vastwood Surge to find 2 lands, and potentially, in the case of Surge, kick it for extra counters or Cycle Path in the late game if we just want to draw. Then Key to the Archive is always useful, finding a card from its 15 card spellbook. And Nissa, who shakes the world, also kind of a win condition, turning our lands into 3-3 creatures and doubling the mana that our forests produce can be a great way to help us ramp. Then we've got a few permission spells with Wash Away to potentially counter an opposing commander for single blue. There's Negate for non-creature spells, and then a classic counter spell for double blue. And then a Time Warp, always nice to take an extra turn, especially for a head on board. And Reverse Rebuke as a one-sided bounce spell, just some very powerful blue cards that are always worth including. And then we get to some of the birds and beasts, starting with our card draw engines, where at 2 mana there's River Hoopoo, a 1-3 bird with flying, and for 5 mana can gain 2 life and draw a card. So if we have some excess mana in the late game, can help us find more action. There's a Garrick's Uprising, 3 mana enchantment saying when a creature enters a battlefield with power 4 or greater, we get to draw a card. So that also applies to copies we get off Taunos, which is also the reason why I'm not playing with Guardian Project in this deck, since if we have Project in play with Taunos, it gets kind of awkward, because first the token will enter the battlefield, and tokens don't trigger Guardian Project, and then once the real creature enters the battlefield, then of course we already have a token with the same name in play, so it's not gonna draw us any cards. So while Project is still fine without Taunos out there, I found it to be a bit of a nombo, so I went with Uprising instead. And then this can also give our creatures Trample, which is always nice. Then there's a Realm Walker, which can potentially name both Bird and Beast if we get to copy it with Taunos to play those off the top of our deck. There's a Garrick's Harbinger with Hexproof from Black, and if it manages to connect with an opponent, we can look at the top cards of our library to potentially reveal a creature and put it into our hand. 
got Oracle of Moldaya to play extra lands off the top. Can also play an extra land each turn to help us ramp. Then I'll bear a 4-4 bird bear with trample when it enters, it draws a card. And then the Great Henge is another awesome card draw engine, although important to note it does not draw off tokens entering, so it won't work off the uh, copies of Tonos, but definitely still worth including. And then Hydroid Crisis also works quite nicely with a Toymaker, because we copy the creature while it's on the stack. So if we cast Crisis for x equals 6, for instance, then we will get a copy that also enters with 6 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it and draws 3 cards. So those also work quite nicely together. Then we've got a whole section dedicated to mutate creatures, and all of these are birds and beasts as well. So they will get copied by Tonos, which means we can very quickly start accruing value of our mutate creatures. If we just simply mutate a Great Horn with Tonos out there, we get to search one land from the original Great Horn, and then two more from the copy. So we end up searching three lands with a single Great Horn, and that will just keep on scaling as we mutate more and more creatures on top of it. And then uh, the Trumpeting Gnar can make three. 3 beast tokens, gem racer to blow up artifacts and enchantments, then we've got parcel beast just as another cheap mutate creature and can also provide extra card advantage, heron will also draw and then the shore shark can bounce opposing creatures, sterix is also quite exciting if we can mutate multiple times on top of it and put a ton of permanence in play and then the demolisher can even blow up opposing lands if we want to giving the opponent some 3-3s three in return but can also blow up our own permanence to make 3-3 three three beasts and then the final section is just the remaining birds and beasts to synergize with Tonos. We've got Frost Trickster giving us a little bit of interaction to keep opposing creatures tapped down, especially if we can make two of those, it can give us a nice tempo advantage. Oracle of the Alpha can be quite fun if we can find the power 9 with it, Ancestral Recall to draw 3, Time Walk for an extra turn, and then Time Twister to maybe refresh our hand. The various ramp artifacts aren't super useful by the time we already have a Tonos copying our various creatures, so those aren't the best draws necessarily, but still seems like a fun card to include. Then we've got a Lovestruck Beast, just a large 5-5, five five. can maybe set up a turn 4 Great Henge as well. We've got Manglehorn to blow up opposing artifacts and make them enter the battlefield tapped. We've got a Nullhide Ferox as another large 6-6 six six with Hexproof, although it does make our non-creature spells more expensive. We've got Obstinate Baloth to gain 4 when it enters. The Oddity 4-4 four four with Trample and Haste can also be transformed to pump our team. And then a Thrak Dusk will gain 5 when it enters, leaving behind 3-3 three three Beast Tokens. Elder Gergroth is another great one, drawing extra cards, making beast tokens or gaining life when it attacks or blocks. We've got a rich scale Tusker, which also is quite nice when we copy it with Tonos, putting plus one plus one counters on the entire team, so that can easily get out of hand. We've got the affectionate Indric to fight an opposing creature, and then at the crackplate Baloth, a 6-6 with haste and hexproof, can also be kicked for additional counters. And last but not least, a Craterhoof Behemoth, also a beast and can be a great way to end the game, especially if we get to copy it with Tonos. And then the mana base, as I've said, pretty simple, not a whole lot of utility lands or creature lands. We've got the Soaring City and Boseju as channel lands. Castle Garenbrick can maybe give us a small mana boost, and then mostly just lots of fixing with the various blue-green dual lands. Enclave is one that I do like to include to potentially draw additional cards in the late game. So yeah, that's our deck. Now let's jump in some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Kenrith, a five-color deck. This hand is missing some early acceleration, so it's probably too slow. This we can try and keep. So I'll fetch an island, turn one. Turn two we can either explore or now play a Paradise Druid. And then we'll be able to play Thanos on turn four. And uh, yes, since we have an extra land, I don't mind explore here. Opponent with a Chromatic Lantern. And we have a couple options. Good Vastwood Surge. Get two extra lands and then next turn play Thanos. And then the Kelpie Guide is a beast we can maybe copy. Opponent also ramping with Chromatic Lantern, now Growth Spiral. And an Emery. 
So they seem to have a bit of an artifact sub-theme. Okay. So let's say we play Tanos. I'll have two mana left, so I guess I might as well go Celestis into Tanos, since Paradise Road is not a beast. Although it will be a nice target for the Mutate as a hexproof creature as long as it's untapped. Binding kills Tanos, can replay it next turn. And then we can still play Lanor Elves alongside it. Now Paradise Druids. So if they kill it again, I can still replay the third time for the low cost of 9 mana. Could see Emery get back like a key to the archive here. And we're still looking for a more exciting beast to copy. It's going to be a Gilded Lotus making 3 mana. And then we could still see a key afterwards. So now our opponent's going to have a ton of mana to sink into Kenra's various abilities. Okay, another mutate creature is nice. So how about we mutate Trumpeting Gnar and then mutate Heron. And make a ton of beasts in the process. And draw some cards as well. Okay. Well, hope our opponent doesn't have a sweeper pretty much. Can play a Lenor Elves. And I'll keep the Heron untapped, I think. So it keeps hexproof in case we pick up another mutate creature. And our opponent explodes. Yeah, double mutate creature with Tonos is pretty good value. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, and our hand seems reasonable. Turn to Leafkin, and then hopefully turn four Tonos, turn five Gergroth times two, up against the Neheb, so. Kind of a red draw discard deck. Don't expect Leafkin to necessarily survive. But uh, Trickster may be a way to keep Nahab in check as well. Into the north, maybe a better turn to play. It's going to be Rahilda. Okay, that uh, I probably want to block with Leafkin, given the chance. So we'll pivot back. And then next turn Trickster can tap it down if needed. Alright, there's Neheb. So we can block Rahilda. And then now tap down Neheb with a Trickster. And hopefully that buys us some time. Next turn Tonos, turn after Gergroth. And at 5 toughness it's not the easiest to kill with burn spells at least. And then once we make a few creatures, the Leafkin Druid's also gonna make extra mana. Opponent flashing back, strike at Rich. And uh, no land drop for the turn it seems. Okay, let's hope Tonos survives. Nahab does get to attack here and refresh the opponent's hand. So I'm not sure if we want to throw Trickster under the bus. Possible just playing Garagroth would have worked out better, but we want to live the dream and actually copy it. So our opponent's got 5 mana for Jaya. Okay. So they can kill the Trickster here if they attack with both. And then we'll be faced with a pretty tough decision whether 
to block Rahilda with Tonos and potentially risk losing it to a burn spell, since Nahap can make quite a bit of mana here if it deals damage to us. So I think I'm just gonna take 7 and then cross our fingers and hope they can deal 5 damage. 3 damage is a lot more realistic. Opponent discarding all 4 cards. And uh, they were not holding any burn spells really. So 5 mana total. And it's gonna be a Chandra dressed to kill. That's fine. I hope you like your hors d'oeuvres extra crispy. So Tano's should be safe at least. You're lucky this is a and a Wily Goblin can get in the way to protect the Planeswalkers. So I should be able to untap, copy Gargroth, and then still play into the north thanks to Leafkin making two mana. And then not playing any copies of Faceless Haven, which would have been a nice line to get here otherwise. Okay, Thanos can force him to lose the Wily Goblin. That seems okay. And double Gargroth is going to be challenging for a red deck to get past. But we'll see. Could see some big expensive plays, like maybe a Fire Emancipation to triple the damage. And then we're still in trouble. Amber Cleave also comes to mind. And our hand's not great, so we need to find more beasts or birds to copy. Jaya finds Cavalier of Flame, that's a good one. Chandra adds a mana. Give a toast. <laughs> I'd love to. And there's Cavalier. Discarding two to draw two. And Cavalier activates. Okay. Happy to double block Nahab. Get to trigger both. And do I just draw two? I think with the Tonos in play that makes sense, as opposed to making beasts, which would also be reasonable. Can still attack with Gergroth and finish off one of the two Planeswalkers. And a Realm Walker now is pretty nice. So we can put one on Bird, one on Beast. Guardian Idol on top. I can maybe get rid of by drawing with Mindstone. Or we can just draw with Gergroth and then see what's next. And then Gergroth. Could go after Chandra while Thanos gets Jaya. And then they'll have to jump with Rahilda. Elvish mistake, neither bird nor beast. So Chandra down at least. And then do I bother drawing with Mindstone? Sure. Play the elf. Carry it on top. Okay, so the beasts are being shy. We are down to 9 life, so have to be a little careful here. Might have to gain life with Gargroth. Mystic, fine to chump uh, Cavalier since it doesn't trample. And Point's gonna cash in Jaya. Finding, ooh, Magma Quake. Okay, that's scary. So that can essentially wipe our board if they want to. So X equals 5, at least kills the Cavalier. If they want to kill Tonos. How many lands in Graveyard is another interesting question. No lands, so the Cavalier doesn't deal any damage on the way out. But uh, yeah, at least Gargroth is still there. And uh, yeah, I think I keep drawing in hopes of finding more action. Ok, 
Can replay Tonos. Boots is nice. Since we cannot equip the boots, we'll just play Carrioted instead. Alright, and looks like we got there, so close one here against Monorat, double Gargroth gets it done. Okay, we're on the draw, and we're up against a five-color Dragon's deck with Tiamat. Our hand leaves a little bit to be desired here, with no two-mana accelerant. Oracle, kind of slow, but could provide some nice card advantage. I guess Manglehorn's likely to hit an artifact early on, so it might still be worth a try. And then Counterspell, of course, pretty huge when countering an expensive dragon. So we can leave up Counterspell turn 2 now. Cold Steel Hearts, something we would love to destroy with Manglehorn. And then it's going to be a slow build-up towards 5 mana. And yeah, the fixing from Cold Steel Heart, probably pretty important too for a 5-color dragon's deck. So taking that out is going to set the opponent back. Can be a nurture for now. Yeah, they can have that. Well, let's mangle horn over into the north. And then next turn we can still Oracle, maybe play an extra land. Okay, Cabaretti Revels is an enchantment. Mangle horn only destroys artifacts. And wash away. Okay, so I think the plan is still. To play Oracle. As opposed to into the north and keep up counter spell. Can hit for two. Then we still have Wash Away available. Not that our opponent's gonna cast Tiamat here. With Castle, it's also slightly easier to maybe play Thanos and another creature in the same turn. But uh, let's play Lands of the Top while we can. Could shuffle with Into the North and maybe play another land of the top, but let's see here. If I play Thanos, I'll still have Wash Away available for Tiamat. That's probably good enough. And then I can attack for four. And then I guess still play a land out. Could have left myself with Counterspell instead of Wash Away available. But uh, yeah, maybe this incentivizes our opponents more to tap out as opposed to having double blue available. Right, opponents still hit the Blazing Sky of Revels. So that's pretty good value. But now we get to have our fun with Tonos. Land first, times two, feels good. And. Uh, yeah, probably double oddity. We'll use castle. And then I could double up on the Tusker as well. Although that does mean tapping out of counterspell mana, which is a little sketchy. So maybe we Realm Walker first, and then next turn go for double Tusker. Name Beast. And one can name Bird. And attack with... Do we attack with Oddity? Don't want to give my opponent a mana boost if I can help it. So maybe we just chill for a turn, and then next turn we're likely attacking for lethal. Take four. Opponent stays back. And Hour of Revelation, we definitely want to counter. Can they counter back is a question. Alright, Shore Shark can bounce Blazing Sky. And I guess we'll put it on the Manglehorn. And our opponent concedes, yeah, Tusker times two would have been quite effective as well. And there we have it, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Urza, Lord Protector. This hand has potential. Mindstone and Explore 
hopefully setting up an early Nissa. Haven can also make an extra mana. So really just need a third land now. Opponent passes. Okay, let's uh, maybe try Haven. Opponent considers. And then next turn I can Mind Stone plus Explorer. Hopefully finding a land. Two would be ideal. For now, Tameshi. Okay, let's uh, stick to the plan. Still nothing. Okay, so a land still casts Nissa next turn. But if we miss, it's kind of a disaster. Gem Racer could eventually mutate to take out Key to the Archive. Alright, there we go. So play Nissa. And then I could even untap my land that's enchanted by Haven. And then I can mutate the Gem Racer onto it to destroy Key. And uh, attack first, I guess. So that was a pretty sweet turn. And then I might have chosen the wrong mutate half here, or maybe the way the layers work, it's going to default to a 3-3 anyways. Yeah, it might just reset it to a 0-0. Zero, zero. Right, there's Urza. And then, let's see here, missing blue, but uh, can still play an Indrik to kill Urza, and that should buy us some time. Rise, my elemental friend. Could also draw with the Mind Stone to try and find blue mana. But for now, hit for six. And uh, yeah, maybe it's worth it to uh, draw with the Mind Stone. Okay, find an Enclave, so that can also draw next turn. Ooh, a Cataclysmic Gearhulk. So, let's see here. I can choose to keep my Planeswalker and then one of the creatures here. Probably still want to keep the Gem Racer, even though it doesn't enable the Enclave. It does make mana. Okay. So, untap our land. And is it just Crater Hoof time? It's probably going to force me to tap most of my creatures. So it's not going to be incredibly effective, but... Yeah, I guess we still have two creatures untapped. That's a healthy attack. 23 total. So if they throw 8 toughness in front, then uh, I think they still die. Sweet. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play with a promising hand facing Ugin, the ineffable, so colorless ramp deck. Got our turn one mystic, turn two idol. Hopefully get Thanos in play. Turn three would be amazing. And then copy our beasts. We even have two mutate creatures, which will pair nicely together. Ooh, make that a third mutate creature now. So we'll have to decide if we want to prioritize more beast tokens or more card draw of Heron. Could see a four mana ramp artifact to set up Ugin next turn. Celestus will also set that up. 
So if I do mutate Heron on Mystic, they can next turn just minus uh, Ugin and take care of it. So maybe I prefer just double Thraktusk this turn and then wait on mutating until we can maybe mutate twice in the same turn. And hit for three. So we could see Ugin deal with Tonos. Then we can maybe mutate Heron on Mystic, fly over. Forsaken Monument is scary. That's gonna double the opponent's mana essentially. So we could see some big plays next turn. Nissa's not bad, although we actually don't have a lot of forests in play. So yeah, what's the move here? Mutate Heron, and then depending on what we draw, I could maybe mutate a Parcel Beast afterwards too. Find Oracle. Ooh, gem Razor. If only I had left myself with more green mana, we would have been able to mutate and blow up all the opponent's artifacts. Guess we'll have to set that up next turn. They want to play Oracle here or mutate Parcel Beast to draw more with Heron. Yeah, let's uh, draw while we can. And then play Forest for the turn. Can make a 1 1. Not sure if that's too relevant. But it can maybe help if our opponent like, ramps out a portal to Phyrexia. Having the 1 1 to sacrifice instead of our key creatures. Okay. Well, if we get to untap to mutate Gem Razor, we're going to be in great shape. Ooh, Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. Yeah, Exiles, Tonos, and probably the Heron. So that was a pretty good play. So if I mutate Gem Racer, I wouldn't be able to mutate Gnar. I could play the Gnar mutate on top of it to get an extra beast, but I think I prefer keeping it to get an extra gem racer trigger next turn and potentially blow up another artifact. So how about I play Nissa? Can untap a forests. And then play another one. And then I could mutate a uh, gem racer on the forests instead of on the larger beasts. Don't think that's gonna be all that relevant. But yeah, let's see what happens if we select the under, since last time we went over and we still ended up with a 3-3. And then destroy Forsaken Monuments. And I guess that's enough for a concession. So yeah, still ended up with a 3-3, but now at least it's still a forest, so it will still make more mana with Nyssa. So I think this is probably the better way to do it. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Chandra, Torch of Defiance. So I probably need to look for a 2-mana ramp card here to be off to a faster start. All these creatures just die to Chandra's minus ability. So our goal is going to be to get Thanos in play as soon as possible, which at least survives Chandra's 4 damage. And hopefully ride that to victory. Don't expect my Mystic to survive. So sadly no turn to cultivate. Hireling to stay on brand here. Idols a turn late, but uh, yeah, we'll cultivate, get a couple islands, and then I can still play Tonos next turn, or if we want to take it slow, develop my mana even more. Although Chandra threatening to potentially cast a 7-drop next turn by making double red. 
Powerling also gains double strike. Yeah, playing Taunus here and hoping it survives is probably not the best strategy since they can easily deal four and have another burn spell left over. So I want to try and get immediate value with the turn we played, basically. Which means going Celestus plus Guardian Idol this turn, I think. And then I can play Crossroads to Scry. And do I want a Vastwood Surge? I think at this point I'm looking for some actual beasts and birds to copy. Should have enough mana. Chandra up to six, so yeah, this is getting close to ultimate. Taking pretty big chunk of damage off the Powerling as well. And Flames of the Firebrands will trigger Powerling once again. <laughs> and the Vengeance to copy it. Opponent's going all in here. Okay, how close are we to dead? Four power double strike, we fall to two. Yeah, that'll probably do it. Sterics would have been fun alongside Parcel Beast. But uh, yeah, Chandra can just deal two damage with the first plus one ability. Celestus could gain one life. Although that involves activating this or passing the turn without casting anything. So that's probably not happening. Um, let's see here. Hupu I can activate to gain two life. Is that to play? Just play Hupu, pass with a plan of activating it. And if it survives, then next turn I could mutate onto it, which could also be fun. Although I'm probably going to be forced to trump the Powerling, realistically. Could also animate Guardian Idol and mutate onto it with the Sterix, and then kill Chandra that way. Although if they have a land, they can easily replay it. So, yeah, not sure what the, the best line is here. I guess animate idol. It's gonna cost six mana to mutate. So then the idol would be tapped. So then I can actually attack Chandra. So I'll go with the Hoopoo line, I guess. Chandra pluses. Need to activate. Maybe should have main phased activated Hoopoo in case we find another elf. Opponent finds a cat. Electrostatic fields. Okay. And they had a Chandra's Triumph as their last card. Okay, fair enough. Powerling goes the distance. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw facing Izuni, Thousand Eyed, so a graveyard deck. Our hand seems fine. Cold Steel to make blue, and then Druids and Great Horn for additional ramp, and then Tusker, Thrag Tusk will be our curve toppers. Thrag Tusk first, Tusker second makes more sense. So we'll see how quickly our opponent can fill their graveyard to make lots of insects. Play Cold Steel first, even though if we play a Leafkin. We might be able to mutate Great Horn on the following turn. I think I'm trying to save this until after I play Tonos. Brontodon, yeah, that can blow up our Cold Steel Heart. So that will strand us without blue. So play Leafkin next turn. Might be forced to mutate Great Horn if we want to get Tonos in play. Get our island. Or I could also just cast a 5-mana Thrag Tusk. Not as exciting without Tonos in play, admittedly. Alright, that gets blue mana as well, so I can still play Tonos here. Hope there's no removal. Especially instant speed removal would be painful. Okay, that works. Do we get to untap with the Toymaker? Don't have very high hopes. Black market, all right, we're in the clear. Time to mutate. And 
and uh, let's see here. Can't quite mutate Great Horn and do something afterwards, since I won't have four creatures for Leafkin if I play, let's say, a Thrank Tusk first. I'm one mana short. But uh, yeah, double Thrank Tusk sounds fun. And then next turn I can maybe both mutate Great Horn and play Tusker. So the black market can potentially make a ton of mana if enough creatures die. A reclamation, another slow plotting enchantment that will eventually be quite powerful. Okay, can also use Enclave to draw. I think the plan is to mutate Great Horn and then still play Tusker. Can get a bunch of lands. Okay, let's get these counters going. And attack. So our opponent can now chump, draw for reclamation. And Hope they don't have something like a Crux of Fate to wipe the board. Although if they do, at least we're left with a few beast tokens of Thrak Tusk. So seven mana total. They could play Izoni, make two insects. Parallel lives to double the tokens. More slow enchantments. But uh, can they survive? Find gets two creatures back. But uh, yeah, that's not quite going to be good enough. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing the first sliver, so five-color sliver tribal deck. And our hands got potential. Goose plus Signets to hopefully set up a turn three, Tonos. And the land will ensure it, assuming my permanents survive. And then Manglehorn can likely blow up a ramp artifact if they're playing those. And Harbinger could be a source of card advantage. Okay, perfect. So now we get to play Signet and Lenor Elves. So I don't even have to use my food token to play Thanos next turn. Since Signet will make the blue. Opponent could be sitting on a counter spell, of course. Is that a reason for me to try and play Harbinger first? It does feel kind of bad not to get to copy. Opponent hasn't played any creatures so far, maybe waiting to play first sliver. And uh, question is whether we want to try and play Thanos, run it into some removal, or if we try and get the ball rolling on Harbinger in the meantime. Given how they've played, I think I'm going to play it slow. And then I'll make another food token as opposed to hitting for one. It's going to be a sword to plowshares, fair enough. Would have answered Thanos as well. Okay. Always have the option of using Busage on the opponent's trial land here to try and mess up their mana. Don't know if that's the best idea since they probably have one of each basic. Belligerent Sliver now. That resolves. Make a food. And uh, at least now the Lovestruck Beast gives us something bigger to try and copy with Thanos. We'll have two 1-1s, one so even if they kill one of them, the Beast can still attack and block. And there's the first Sliver. So no targets yet for Manglehorn. Opponent did not cascade into anything they wanted to cast. And, uh, yeah, double block. Seems reasonable. Possible they have a Gravedigger in their hand that they want to cast. But I don't know if we really need Gilded Goose for much. And I don't want to give up the 1-1 one, one and be unable to potentially attack and block with a Beast. So 
So we'll copy the beast. And then the question is, do we run out a Manglehorn? Probably better to wait in case an artifact does show up. And no attacks, so yeah, waiting for a big finisher here. Something like a Crater Hoof Behemoth would be pretty effective. Although I guess also kind of awkward with Beast no longer able to attack. Bone Scythe for double strike, that's gonna hurt. And a Leeching Sliver off Cascade. And that's gonna find the uh, one mana Sliver presumably. Striking Sliver, so they've got double strike, first strike, a bit redundant, and then a Leeching Sliver. All from just one card. And that uh, does mean it's going to be very difficult for us to make any attacks. Into the north doesn't really help. Yeah, I might just play Manglehorn to get an extra creature in play. And then no attacks. Chromatic Lantern, of course, shows up the turn after we play Manglehorn. At least it's still entered tapped. And now a Faceless Agent, a pretty good one too. Finds a Taimyo Safekeeping, not the best to cascade into. And then the Agent will find another Sliver. get to untap just to land the draw. Yeah, we need some uh, action spells here. At least for now there's a bit of a board stall, but that's not gonna last. And Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. Okay, opponent gets to draw two cards per turn now. At least they milled some pretty useless cards. A Lancer Sliver doesn't cascade into anything. And we get to untap. Finding a Pouncing Shore Shark. Now we're talking. So I can mutate, bouncing one creature with the first copy, and then the second copy should be able to bounce two more. And uh, can even do it at instant speed, although I'm probably better off bouncing first. Although it does also mean opponent gets to replay their cards, re-enable Cascade. So that's kind of scary with all this mana to replay their creatures. So unless the Shore Shark is setting up a one-hit KO, I may not actually want to cast it yet. And we can maybe save it as kind of a surprise interactive spell. Opponent is still pulling ahead with Jace. But uh, even if I were to bounce, let's say, Bone Scythe and the yeah, opponent has multiple creatures giving first strike. So let's say we bounce Bone Scythe and first sliver. They could still replay both next turn and get a bunch more stuff. And this attack would be far from lethal. So I think we actually have to pass. But uh, still a good interaction to have available. Hopefully find another Mutate creature soon. Boots and Nissa gone. That's fine. And a Grave Shifter, like we suspected. Cascades into Dryad for mana fixing. And Grave Shifter gets back Belligerent Sliver. Belligerence cascades into a Drakescape for an Earth. And no one drops left. So we'll see if the opponent decides to get more aggressive or if they're happy to stay back. No attacks. I think we still untap. And Indrik's not bad. So we'll play Indrik. And 
make a copy. And then I probably want to fight Bonescythe Sliver. So that dies. Double Strike does not work in a fight. And what else do we try and kill? Maybe just the Dryad as not to give them more things to unearth with Dragscape. At least unearth does not trigger Cascade. So maybe I take out, let's say, the Lancer as one of their other first strike creatures. And then I can at instant speed bounce the Striking Sliver, so they won't have first strike, which could potentially mess up the math. So what does the Jace Ultimate do? Draw seven cards. That's going to be problematic. Thassa's as Oracle, so... I guess her opponent has Oracle plus Jace as a win condition. Still kind of waiting for an opening to uh, mutate the Shore Shark and potentially make a big attack. Yes. Opponent milling Uprising, which could have been nice. And Orvar, also Sliver, cascades into Dovin's Veto. Not the best synergy there. Okay. Potent seems content just sitting back. At some point I'll need to try and answer Jace before they get to draw 7. But uh, Potent's got a lot of blockers, so it's difficult to really pick a window. Let's say I were to mutate the Shore Shark now. Then I could bounce, let's say, the first sliver and striking sliver. Yeah, that would potentially set up some good attacks. So I might actually go for it here. Opponent could be holding instant speed removal. I think I'll just mutate on the elf. Even though that does mean potentially the beast no longer being able to attack and block. So we'll bounce first sliver. Striking sliver. And what else? Maybe a dryad. Untap and obstinate Baloth. Isn't the worst. So we can play Baloth, make a copy. And then now we need to make an attack. Probably all at Jace. And could even send Tonos since I can always replay it if they try and kill it. Does Manglehorn attack? Sure. Alright, Jay's down. There is a lesson. So at least the Striking Sliver won't cascade into anything useful. Dryad's also not a Sliver. So it's mainly the first Sliver that could cascade into something powerful. And the Faber Elder, not bad. It's going to be a 5-5 five, five here. And then hopefully find more mutate creatures to put on the Lanor Elves and get incremental value. Sadly we don't get the time to look through the opponent's entire deck here with Cascade, which you normally should be able to. Maybe time to sacrifice these food tokens. And a Great Horn, alright. Mutates onto Shore Shark. And keep bouncing more stuff. First Sliver is gone. 
Striking Sliver is gone. Thin out the deck. And our opponent explodes. So yeah, it was quite a staring contest with our opponent playing quite passively, but eventually we found enough beasts to take over. Sweet. Alright, so we got to see our Toymaker deck in action. Not one of the better commanders out there, has a 5-drop that doesn't have an immediate impact the turn we play it, needs to be able to survive, and then we need to follow up with some large beasts, hopefully. So it does require quite a bit of setup, and quite vulnerable to opposing interaction as well. But if you can pull it off, it's definitely a fun time. So that's going to do it for today's gameplay. want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.